You want a piece of me, motherfucker? I'm right here, bitch, and I ain't fucking leaving until I get a piece of that New England Patriot ass, motherfucker. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, I'm David Zucker, the assistant to the moderator, Tim Belger. I'd like to welcome all of you to the weekly meeting of the College of Complexes, the program for people who think. We have several policies here. First of all, one floor at a time. Second, no personal attacks. Yeah, that's right. Third, there will be a few dollar tuition charge collected from each of us. In order to the cause may defray its expenses. For the what the fuck? You got me fucking kidding me! For the restaurant is in health, and that means that if we want to continue to be here, they have to make money, some money off of us. That means you might as well get yourself some dinner or something else to eat and or drink. Our format is as follows. First, we were, we are going to have announcements of first our my, our um, coordinator Charlie Pena will announce the upcoming programs, then we will have other announcements of neighborhood or community interest. Those most main announcements and not speakers. Then our future speaker will come up and talk for Producer will come up and talk for about an hour or so on the evening's topic. Then we will have questions and answers. And those, this is like Jeopardy, those must be in the form of a question. Save the speeches for later. Otherwise, you may hear, hear somebody hollering, what their, what's their question? Then after that, we will have rebuttals. Then we'll portion out the time of the person. And at that point, you can give whatever speech you want to. We prefer to report the speaker, but you don't have to. You can talk about whatever you want to during a lot of time. And finally, the speaker will then get the last word. All right, there, Charlie, it's time for you to lead off with the announcements of upcoming programs. All right, thank you. Uh, welcome to meeting number 3705 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. First of all, as always, I want to alert everyone that we maintain a Google email group, uh, which you are recommended, is recommended in central at the top of our website to subscribe to it. Get one or two meetings, notices of upcoming topics. There also is a meetup group, which functions much in the same fashion. Um, so recommend that you take advantage of either one of those or both uh, to keep aware of it. Uh, as always, will everyone please mute their program that put an X over your microphone at least during the presentation. And I must ask those in attendance in person at the restaurant to please keep down the chatter because the microphone is open and does pick that up. So please be respectful of those uh, attending by Zoom and curtain the conversations at least until the presentation is over. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On March the 4th, in conjunction with International Women's Day, we will host the hear from Rise Up for Abortion Rights, a women's advocacy organization that you can read more about uh, on the website with links provided if you seek additional information. March the 4th. On March the 11th, an organization which has not been to the college before, uh, the Community Renewal Society, 
is engaged in various things, activities in distressed communities. An interesting organization. I recommend everyone learn more about them. Uh, on March the 18th, our own Enrique Perez, who attends, he may be here tonight, will be taking on the issue of ownership of social media and regulation, free speech issue, very relevant to the college complexes. So March 18th, this is a hot topic right now, as everyone aware of. March the 25th is presently open. If you'd like to speak or know of an organization we should invite, please contact me. The information, the link, the information is there. All I need is a title and a brief description of the presentation. On April the 1st, we will be commenced with our Earth Month series of speakers. We try to feature Earth Month speakers, though we may have others. But on April the 1st, we'll be welcoming Nuke Watch. Nuke Watch. We have some issues regarding nuclear energy and nuclear missile armored weapons. You feel me? For all you front running ass motherfucking fans. All right, Tim, you got a little bit a little faster with this guy. Why are you letting him in? I don't know. All right. Uh, last of all, uh, I'd like to mention that we do maintain two archival uh, sites, uh, pages on our accessible through our website, one which contains uh, video recordings uh, of the lecture, the lecture library. Uh, you're, welcome, you're recommended that you take a look at that if you want to see a recording again of something perhaps you enjoyed or would like to see again. We also maintain, I just call it a list of links, a relatively new feature in which we store um, PowerPoint presentations, which have been shown at the college complexes. You can find the one that was uh, used last week on CJ, the environmental law. Uh, you also, there's certain films recommended by speakers. If you'd like to recommend something we take a look at, please send it to me. This should be free online films. Uh, though free online. Anyhow, that's it for now. Uh, thank you very much. Take it away. Okay, uh, David, you got the mic again, and you're going to introduce uh, our speaker tonight. First of all, are there any more announcements? Andy, you got anything or anybody else? All right, here we go now for the announcements. All right, tonight our speaker is well known to this college. Bob Lichtenberg has spoken here many times on philosophical topics. He also coordinates the speakers, which is our philosophical discussion group. Bob, if you want to stay there and present, we can put the camera right on you from there. He's going to talk tonight on what is it, the, on the art of on the philosophy of love. Would you please give it up for Bob Lichtenberg? Dr. Bob Lichtenberg. All right, Bob, when you're ready, it's good up. Okay. Start and sit down up there, and we'll have you on online here soon. Okay. When you're ready, we'll uh, get you there. And, uh... All right, just sit down anywhere, and you don't have to stand. You can just sit down if you want, or. Okay, I just pull the chair out and go ahead and sit down. We got gotcha. you. We got you on camera, Bob. Okay, and the mic, and we'll let you're good to go. Just go ahead and sit down, or if you want, yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. A little louder, please. Speak into the microphone. Please speak into the mic. Uh, I am speaking in my PC. Yeah, that's better now. You can hear me. Oh, okay. I got some live out there. <laughs> and thank you for coming. I know what it means to take time. 
There's never enough of it. We always want to do more. There's a lot of other things we could be doing now. But um, so it takes three hours of your time and it's way too long. Nobody meets for three hours. That's not. Sorry. I'm not sorry. I won't change his mind whatsoever. He's not open to that. Um, Charles, ask him to hold the mic uh, close, about uh, about a hand's length away from his chin. Yeah, you keep you keep you keep pulling it away from your chin, so it's got to be about six inches away, just like about a fist full, about a fist. Just go ahead and go. No, we're 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 good, we're good. Just go ahead and about six. They were having trouble hearing you on, online. Okay. Yeah, I. I think I'm the oldest student at the college. I first talked here at the college complex in 1980. I think I've been there since I've been teacher. A little closer, Bob. Bob, a little closer to you. I think He's got to have the mic a hand length three inches away from his mouth. Three inches. They can't hear what you're saying. Mark, they can't hear you because you're all the way down. You got to have it close to your mouth, much like this. You said six inches. Like that, like that, Bob. That's good. Yeah, sure. And there's someone who complains where people are. Yeah, I'm, I've attended a college even longer than Charlie. Oh, I haven't done as much work as he has. He's done a lot of work. I appreciate that. Keep it going, keep it alive. It's been a long time. Uh, pretty much. <clears throat> I sent you a copy of my topic online. The friends who had emails, if I had your email, I sent you a copy of my talk. And I'm kind of proud of that because that's the first time that anyone has sent out a talk before, before the. Um, oh, yeah. Talk itself in the 72 year history of the College of Complexes. I'm proud of that fact. But I am disappointed in the turnout. Not many people are interested in love except the Zoom on love during their bus at home. I'm not excuse me, sorry, I said that. But um, <clears throat> no one, no friends of mine that come except my home. And <clears throat> they hear me talk, and not, got no support for them. Okay. I've always supported them, but they never supported but me. Put the mic close. See, I told you someone would bitch. Just, just Bob, just keep where it's at is fine. Just keep talking, okay? We're, we're good. Just, just, just don't get, just, just okay. get things about where it's right. at. Um, I think it's clear, no. Yeah, so you see what a rare thing love is. Human friendship's hard in this society. I don't have a damn friend anymore. Yeah. They're keeping psychologists across the country busy. They can't. don't even last. How long is love going to last? How rare is love? Pretty damn rare. Yeah. Friendships are. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a single friend I could depend on for anything. The slightest favor. I know damn well a friend won't come through for me. Don't even bother to ask them. Fair society has come to with all this technology and Minecraft. At least there's no libertarians here and there. They're not interested in love. They're interested in hate. They're trying to break us apart. Oh, there's one. Oh, where? We got one here, Bob. That that's uh oh, you know. Only one? There's usually more. Oh. Um, Um, that's what it is. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about love now, all about love. I'm going to have this when this talk I did. Please, can you speak more clearly? Um, People cannot hear online what you're saying. Speak a little bit more clearly. Just keep just you. what you were doing before, and we're good. And we've got to stand out so you have something to take away with you. On this very important topic, I'll try to give, um, have a talk, something to give away, something to take home. 
The microphone closer, please, to your mouth. People cannot hear what you're saying. You might leave it here. Probably will. Some of you anyway. Not, I don't mean any individual. Okay, all about love. Love is extremely meaningful in our life. Now we're just, uh, that's my introduction. It has a lot of meaning. It could have, it could have a lot of meaning. I'll explain why in a moment. Um, first thing you should do when you're dealing with any highly ambiguous word, like love is to define it. And uh, I define it as an emotional state, not an intellectual one so much. And Charlie had it up to them. He got my title wrong too. I'm not going to talk much about the philosophy of love. There's not much on there. I'm going to talk all about love. You know what I said I would in my sermon. Um, Okay, I define love as the uh, strong emotional state that the person feels affection for another person. It's very hard to define. It's very broad, very complex. Their love is different, unique, very unique. A lot of cultures have a lot of words, many words for love. Perhaps this word can't be defined because it is spiritual or intangible. We talk about speaking to often. Um, but we have very regrettably, horribly misused this word. Really cheapened it, like for example, he loves, he loves candy. Bob, you keep you keep forgetting the word love there. That word love doesn't have any meaning. You are uh, I have a strong license to come from the Bob, Bob you're, 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 you're letting it fall again. About like this. Like you had it before. With the mic. You were letting it kind of that's what my mouth. You want to bite my mouth? Yeah. I could hear it louder now. Yeah, that's that's about that's about right. Okay. I'm sorry to be an anal on it, but it's, it's 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 going. Go ahead. Okay, love is the greatest and highest value virtue. The highest virtue. There's many virtues. Like honesty, reliability, stuff like that are virtues. But love is the highest, it's the greatest of all the virtues of excellent personality strength. Well. Is that uh, the most common thing in the creative arts, the most creative idea? You find it all over the literature, and a lot of literature is about love. Uh, music, like rock music, is almost entirely about love, teenage love, maybe, but love nonetheless. And it's very important for, for the people that music is rock. A lot of movies are on love. I think I saw one by Stephen Spielberg called, called Cattleman. It's about his love, movies, love of his family, his family stuff for him. It was all about love. How many movies are coming out now because of the COVID aftermath? So, a lot of movies in the past are all about love. All right, the core virtues, the core components of love, of love. are to be intimate, be close. To have passion for one another, strong feelings, strong emotional feelings, and commitment. This commitment leads people to uh, uh, attach to one another for long periods of time as a pair in marriage. Some last 70 years, most last 30 or 40. A lot of them break up right away, but then when they try it again, they're going to be successful. So it does lead humans to bonding. It does lead to the perpetuation of the species. So it's a basic human drive, love is of mammals. Like hunger and thirst. 
talk more about that later. Love involves caring for another and identifying with her needs. That's how I was taught on the fine love. Identifying a willing to go to another person, wanting to go to another person. Um, that's the time. Okay, we got you, Bob. Don't worry. Sure. No, I, I can see. We can. We can. I got your thing up here, but I'll show you what you look like here. Yeah. No, I, I see you're in a small screen. See. We can. We can I'll show you. Here. I guess not. No, no, we got we got your hand out right up here. So, no, I'm not talking about my hand out. I actually visual Oh, I was I guess I ran out of time, so my apologies, yeah. please. But we can we can we can get something in there. Don't worry, I'll get your Yeah, you can get something please. Uh let me get back to the Zoom meeting. Here. Well, I, like I said, I know I was aware of your request on Wednesday of, of this week, and my negligence is what caused them not yeah. to be done so i'm being fully accountable and i just basically forgot to do it bob and that's all that there was and i do apologize I that in, but I could do it. well yeah okay. you're right but uh yeah sure will. let's let's just keep going you know what i mean about friends old friends ain't time for nothing don't do anything for you and if i was they put out the camera and memory and come a little for you they ain't gonna do it I think I might try to love it. I still think you can find it as I'll explain. You can. I have lots of it in my own way. Not a good friend of Crystal Mary. Super sweet wife. And pretty wife. And she died almost 10 years ago suddenly. Um, okay. Well, some people can, um, love people different than themselves. Opposites do attract them. You know, some people like opposite traits. Which, in their, uh, lovers, both physically and mentally, but most of us prefer to have people just like us, people the same as us. We prefer that by far. Liking opposites is pretty rare. We even like opposite skin colors. That sure that drives us crazy. And, you know, we can't get along with that. It's a huge problem in the US. So this is a different skin color. And just that one thing that you can see is physical. You know, and it looks like we're never going to solve that problem. Um, one difference, you know, so we like similarities. We like the things the same as us for the most part. We love that, those kinds of things. And that difference is very much. So that's uh, the psychology of love. You know, um, some of the science and art of human behavior about well, some of that was philosophical too, like the virtues. We have um, the ancient Greeks. They had they had six forms. I didn't know that. One of them, the highest, second thing. Agape love is the highest. And carries on in Christianity. And Christianity even uses that word out of faith. Christianity is very influenced by Greek philosophy. Mostly uh, Plato, of all people, Plato believes in people. Yeah. That's the case for his craft, not for his thing. They know the true reality. It's once in a while, something takes the thing. There's no, there's a greater world outside, there's a world he does. There really 
really does exist, and it's more real. Therapy just a weak reflection of it. So that's Platonism in a nutshell. And that's a good class he was all about. He called her. And um, <clears throat> we see it in Christianity later on. I'll mention that later on. The lowest form of love for the Greek of their six types was Eros, or erotic love, or sexual love. And again, Plato says that this is the um, lowest form of love, it's physical love, bodily love, love, animalistic. Yeah. And it's a denial of obvious reality of um, how pleasurable love can be, basically. But that's the great set Platonism. The Romans were very close to the Greek culture. They believed in um, uh, basically one type of love called um, 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 that covered all the types of love for them. They were mostly physical. They never wrong. They didn't have the love that Plato did. The physical and the spiritual. The Romans are more down to earth. They're good at things like engineering. Not so good on ideas like love. Um, all right, Asian cultures, Chinese view of love is primarily Confucian, and then it focuses on having deep respect towards the beloved. And sometimes the beloved even became like God, but that means we don't worship their ancestors. And so much they believe in deep respect. However, this is no longer Chinese philosophy, Chinese philosophy. Today is Maoism, which is forced on the Chinese by communist Mao, who killed millions to innocent people to, uh, to support the Mao communism on the Chinese. Well, it, it is close to their um, philosophy, was close to it. But they had no choice either. All right, uh, no, I'm not all right. That's the way it is. The Japanese had three types of love. They had selfless love, which monks practice. They denied themselves. That's coming up later in the party. I don't mean Gary, Indiana. I mean, way further than that. Uh, that selfish or romantic love, a good example of that is uh, the movie In the Realm of the Senses. In the Realm of the Senses. Did you ever get to see that? See that? Okay, excellent. Uh, you know, of Japanese romantic club, <clears throat> highly sexual, getting to the point of nirvana, for sure. That's for me, I'm not here. Um, <laughs> now he's hungry, I'm sure. Um, not for now, hell no, no, that's too much. Oh, give me food, I got here food. I mean, no, the hell is that? I'm being sarcastic. Uh, all right, third, the Japanese believe in the desire to be cared for by an authority figure. See how different their society is? That's very different from us. We could care less about the Biden love you. <laughs> very different. East is east and west is west. Never the twain shall meet. And I think that's true. Who said that? If we who east is east, west is west. Yeah. That's what they think so. Um, the Indians, are, I don't mean the American Indians, they're either uh, South in the continent, subcontinent of Asia. <clears throat> they regard love as desire. Um, that arose from the creation of the universe from nothing. Actually, I'm so impressed to find out that the Indians believe that the universe is created from nothing. Actually, neat, I copied that down. Then in Persia, 
Pretty golf show. Um, present day of Rock and Iran. They're all of the, all aimed at, um, at the um, divine love. Next, um, we come to religious views of love on page two. Um, Judaism begins with the Hebraic account concept of accounts that were for loving kindness, be loving and kind. Jewish holy books, the Torah. Oh, the Torah collection of books and their prophets. They command the Jew to love their neighbors as itself. The golden rule, which you find in all religions, all world religions that I'm talking about now. Oh, no, I'm not talking about all of them, but the big one. Now, in Christianity, God himself is a, himself from some the Christian, oh, okay. not for me. Some people say God is a woman. You know, because he acts like God acts like a woman in being creative and nurturing. But the Christian religion is very patriarchal. You know, men do everything. Women are accountable for very little. Well, nothing. Never the Catholic tribe of Mary. Um, the ideal of human love and Christianity is charity. Um, selflessness and unconditional love as a parent does for her child. And um, um, Jesus Christ joined his followers to love everyone, even one's enemies. That's pretty hard to do. But, uh, I can make sense of that. How could I love my enemies? Oh, here, Martin Luther King did it. He says, I cannot love my enemies, but I could like my enemies. Wait a minute. No, I got it backwards. King said, I could love my enemies, but I cannot like them. What he said. Martin Luther King. And that's how he solved that problem. Um, okay, in the Bible, that's um, the writings of the best reflection in the West on God. Because the word Christianity is the only religion that was highly developed in the West and didn't even come from the West. It came from the Middle East, it came from Israel, Palestine, or what's known as today. They're known as that thing. It was developed in the West, but Christianity was the only religion developed in the West. So it's the only Western religion. So it expresses our Western ideals. I found in the Bible, in the Bible in the Old Testament, tells about the multiplicity, all the different kinds of love, every different possible kind of love you can find in the Old Testament. Um, especially uh, infidelity on the part of the males, sometimes females, like I believe Judas was unfaithful. I'm not sure of that, though. Don't quote me on that one. Um, as in, in that example. Um, okay, and the rest of Christianity is expressed by Jesus, as I mentioned. His highest view was to love you, your enemies. Love everyone, no matter what they do to you. In Islam, that religion, the community will love Allah, the God, the one monotheistic, patriarch, very patriarchal God, Islam, and uh, Love other mountains of the brotherhood of their faith. That's about it. Buddhism 
regard sexual love as an obstacle to be enlightened religiously about the true reality. The enlightened is to see that sexual love prevents one from reaching enlightenment. And the enlightened person detaches herself from all all of uh, from, from everything from herself. And that's shown in third selfish interest in how there's one <coughs> example of the story in Buddhism is um, there are two people in the jungle and a um, tiger starts chasing them from a distance. And they run away from the tiger, of course, but there's a low wall. And the only way they could get over the wall is one of them uses his back as a ladder for the other one to get up. So one of the Buddhists does do that. And the other guy escapes. But the remaining Buddhist is devoured by the lion, the tiger in this story. And um, and um, the one who's devoured no longer has to be reborn. Because he, he gave up his life for the other. This leads into Hinduism. It's another religion. That believes in reincarnation, believes in continual rebirth. And one of the lowest forms of birth, according to Hindu, is being born in a physical body. And it's very stressful and, and trouble because the soul is the world. The world's full of meaninglessness, it's full of death and destruction. Look at, look at nature, look at how the animals fight and kill one another for food. You know, it's a perpetual struggle. It's a horrible place. The best thing is not to be reborn again, not to be reincarnated. To not exist. Of course, most Hindus couldn't accept this, or Buddhists. That's too much reality for them. They believe they would go to Nirvana. And be a part of that happiness, but not as a self, but as part of the whole. That's baloney. Buddha never said any such thing. He never couldn't close. That's so all the Buddhists and Hindus could feel good to talk, uh, about God. You know. All right, let's get to philosophy. If you have any questions or comments, or there's anything you do not understand, please ask me to explain it to you. I'd be glad to do that. Uh, philosophy and love. Well, philosophy. Um, <clears throat> Evaluates critically and creatively our basic, a person's basic beliefs about love. It's not a big topic in philosophy, except in making meaning of it. And that's too much in philosophy. They're not trying to talk about it. They started said, My talk is going to be about this. I didn't say it was. He changed it for me. You know, it's covered here. I don't know that well. Okay. Out there. Um, okay, Fossey. I'll uh, put love in the fields of ethics and social philosophy. Ah, uh, here's a good point, though, coming up. I want to emphasize this point. I gavel. I want to pay attention to you. I usually bang when people out of order at the speakers, but uh, I don't know, I'm bringing it down because it's an important point. The important point is that uh, Rick, important point is that uh, all thinking about love is guided by logic, the laws of logic. The laws of logic are absolute, they're true for all thinking. They apply to all thinking, and they, they criticize all thinking, and they praise all thinking. And um, even yours, they criticize it as not good right now. 
For our thinking, all thinking. So the laws of logic are also universal in addition to being absolute or applied to everything. <clears throat> they apply to everyone everywhere. And they also. So they're universal. They're perhaps the only thing that is. Oh, he's got it. <laughs> What else is universal? Something else that's universal has no exception, applies to everything. I can't, the only thing I can think of is meaning, meaning applies to everything. Everything has meaning, good or bad. It has an effect, it has an impact. That's the only other universal to take laws of logic. So there are laws of logic, there are laws about opinions, like we say at the college, people engage in opinion groups. People talk about their opinions as if they're all equal. They're not. Some are good and some are bad, according to the laws of logic. And they're not difficult. These laws are not difficult whatsoever. Induction, deduction is not ours. They're college freshmen to handle them, even high school. They're teaching grade school with computers now. Um, okay, let's move on. Um, all right, a little bit about the nature of love. Well, the greatest skeptic who ever lived on pure mind, saying the French guy, he could not doubt the love of his disciples wasn't French love. And I'm saying that I'm not going to. The fact that he could not doubt his love of philosophy, his love of uh, pursuing wisdom, knowing how to make practical decisions. Found that the good decision and the deep truths of life. Dr. B loved that. He wanted to know deep truth. He wanted to know what the good really was. He didn't want to think it was money like Edwin Thur was, and that was the only good for most people. Still is. And it might be even worse today because money's easier to get by uh, all classes. Besides, he's really interested in depth, you know, he's interested. And philosophizing. He couldn't doubt that, that to undertake philosophy was the greatest thing a person could do. <clears throat> and plus, he held that position, even though he knew <clears throat> that the ancient Athenians would murder him. They would murder him by executing him, which he did. He did make him drink Temat poison, and he died a horrible death. But it goes in the toes up. I don't know if that's true or not. I read that. But Socrates did die for philosophy. But you see how he makes philosophy stronger that way. <laughs> Excuse me. I can I <clears throat> She's getting it for you, Matt. Um, not that he's even urged his own death, his own execution, his own murder, his own death of his life. It wasn't just their own. Um, he would tell them things like, I'm on a mission from God. That just pissed off the Athenian jury, that just angered them. Um, and they um, sentenced him to death sooner and more surely because of that. By the way, that was in the Blues Brothers movie with Aunt Gordon Belushi. They said they were on a mission to God. They probably had done that. And, uh, 
cows pass on five days up. But they were on a mission from God means we're doing, when we think, when we philosophize, we're doing what's most divine in us, what's most godlike. Just ask the deep questions and try and get answers. You'll never get a full answer because the questions are way bigger than we will. But you'll get clearer and clearer about the truth. It'll be revealed more clearly to you. The more you engage in it, and the more you'll be able to do with your life, your philosophies. And that's for Socrates. It was his love. He loved philosophy. He gave his life for us. Embrace that. But then you know, if he was executed, he was all if your soul just survives, put the leg in. He would go to he would Socrates would go to philosopher's heaven, where um, people would be philosophized you know, all the time and they wouldn't put you to death for doing that. Up there in philosopher's heaven. He gets it. <laughs> um Socrates was great at joking and putting the Greeks down. They seem they didn't get it either. They were duh, you know, duh. Give us some money. Give me food, duh. Give us Socrates and fire me. Kill Socrates, uh, I'll say him. But, uh, the nature of love is not only rational, it's not primarily rational, despite Charlie's drawing of the brain. Love is mostly emotional. Volition is the matter of the will, the matter of the desire, the matter of the irrational part of the soul, not the rational. It makes very, very little sense, you know, logically. So it makes a lot of sense emotionally. Subconsciously. Um, as Pascal wrote, place Pascal wrote, the heart, which is a symbol of love, he put up there. And um, I also. I have one here which I keep up my head. They remind me about the great power of the subconscious of the heart over the head. You know, the mostly heart turn up from my head. As the Pascal says, the heart has its reasons. Not a good word for them. Which reason or thinking ability does not know. So the heart. That's the reason for believing what it goes to. It has strong feelings for it. And Freud also emphasized the subconscious nature of love. Freud said all love comes from sex. That's long and short of every form of love is sex. Maybe it was for him. Maybe he could speak for himself. Not for me. But I mean, it was for his being corrupt society, which all the rich men had all kinds of hookers working for them. Now, true back then, of that society, certainly not ours. I wish Freud had gone into a different profession. <laughs> you just didn't get nobody else to it. I'm over here having that. Um, I'll try and come back. There's a joke somehow. <clears throat> okay, Christian philosophy. St. Pete's love is the basic principle not only of creation, God created the universe, but he loved reality. He loved having something else. He loved having humans around him. Um, but love also for Christian philosophy to write the basis of providence or God granting your prayers, giving you what you want. If you love God properly, he'll give you what you want. 
Then we can go get what you want to the young woman's property. That's a Christian thought system. And we also said, of course, so there's a basis of salvation. If you make it up to heaven, uh, you will find love, eternal love, nothing but love in heaven. So it's big, the Christian philosophy. Um, But well, love is, um, as I said, a prime, a primal passion, and say first prayer. The deepest passion, almost all philosophers, almost all of them agree that love is a primal passion. Love is the highest passion of them all. One exception might be Nietzsche. Nietzsche wasn't a big advocate of love. I don't know what the hell Nietzsche wanted. I can't make sense out of Nietzsche whatsoever myself. As far as I could tell, Nietzsche wants us to be supermen, <laughs> not women. Supermen, no superwomen, please. Just supermen. I think there's no women here. <laughs> they'd, be, uh, they'd be at them by now. Uh, what the hell is there? What is a superman? I have no idea. He says superman creates his value. Well, shit, I just gave it a value. You know, I've been treated with uh, technical values. So how was Nietzsche? Um, <clears throat> Nietzsche's not preaching to me. So love is more of a, a passion for the philosophy. For the Aquinas, the great thing of the Catholic Church, love is the first act of the emotion of the will and the appetite or desire. Not really. Don't say that. All right, Benedict Spinoza, Jewish philosopher, did was kicked out uh, of his society because of that. Anyway, uh, he wrote a very intriguing essay about the intellectual of his time, down by the Jews. So, um, He did very good in that part. Spinoza. We never heard. I'll conclude the value of love. Only philosophy can tell you the value of anything. Only philosophy can deal with what is valuable, what is not. Only philosophy can tell you what ought to be and what should be. Because it deals with prescriptions, not descriptions. There's logic to help us. It deals with intangible. We value the intangible. It feels very much about love. Thank you. It's made one small screen. Time to paradise. Um, uh, he mounts, to another point of his character, he mounts to the highest heaven where he finds the, the greatest value of his love, love of God, for Dante. But he was summing up the Middle Ages. So this has been pretty scholarly stuff here, studying all these great thinkers. And um, I said that when I went to college, I did an honors program. All the great books of the West, and I got to read them all. Well, I didn't, I couldn't read all of them, but uh, <clears throat> a lot of them. And, and we were lectures, we had the best lectures in the college or the university. Now, school was in these books. That was great. I got the ideas of Dante and Spinoza and Aquinas, you know, uh, most of these courses. Um, all right, the value of love has great disvalue. There's no despair deeper than someone whose love has been betrayed. Or if you've had unrequited love yourself, you love someone else, but they don't love you back. You know as much that hurts. That hurts a hell of a lot, you know, when they don't love you back. Uh, but on the other hand, it's great value in love. 
According to Shakespeare in Romeo and Juliet, Juliet says to Romeo, my boundary is as boundless as the sea. She means my love. My boundary is as boundless as the sea. My love is deep. The more I give she, the more I have. They're both are infinite. I think Shakespeare has a profound truth there. And love is infinite. There is no bounds to it. There is no end. There's no limit. That's how great its value can be when you can find love and make love. It's infinite, infinite, which is really infinite. It's infinite value. It gives us new life, new life. A lover desires it so much that she wants to be united with the other person physically, sexually. A lover willingly gives more than she gets from her beloved willingly. She wants to give rather than get. How rare is that? Very rare. Find it only in love. Love conquers all. Well, for the, how to read him in third year Latin class. <clears throat> read it, read it. Spoken Latin to Aeneas about the journey to Aeneas after the Trojan War. Great story, great book. And we read it in Latin, studying Latin helped me a lot to comprehend the ideas because yeah, yeah, most philosophical ideas are in Latin. But Latin is much more specific of a language, like the grass something. We would say English comprehend, but for Latin, you know, get your hands on it. Get your hands on something that helps a lot to understand the abstract ideas, to know the concrete background from which they came. That helped me enormously in graduate school. That's who I am where I met my sweetheart, Mary, and uh, Super Street Southern Bell. I don't think they have them anymore now. They're very pretty, too. Um, well, I digress. I um, love country song. And if you want to be happy and you want to survive, you need to love. I love everyone you want to survive. It's very hard. Same with society. It does not have love. It's going to decay. It's going to ruin itself. Many societies have. And many are low points even today, as far as that goes. Okay, so love binds people together in generosity and benevolence. Excellent, that's excellent. There's one more to dance for than that. It subdues the beast inside of us. There is a beast lurking inside of all of us. This year, when the socks stop at the Love allows us to escape even the vicious master of old age. Augustine gives us concise, the wise advice. Love and do what you want. Pretty good advice, right? If you just love and you can do what you want. If you have a loving attitude, you can know what love is when you do it, you do it every day. As long as you have love, that's all you need. There's the Beatles. You're right. All you need is love. Then everything else will follow. Love a thing, love a study, love a career, love of another person. Genuine love is satisfying. You can't satisfy love. You can't satisfy a want like money. That was not more money. Candy, that was not more candy. Those are wants. The love is a need. Once you got it, you're satisfied. You find love. Anything more. So, um, almost done here. Um, love does what it acts for the good of the beloved. Oh, sorry, I'm skipping things. Then when love is satisfying, like a want, 
It's a real need. It's a human need. Genuine need. Just in thinking about goodness and beauty. There's all the loved ones, the good of the beloved. Just to think about her beauty and goodness. We found something we don't really like. It's emotional. But emotions are response to their whole being. I know it's a man. It is response, response to the whole thing. Your brain is not very good. My brain doesn't work too well. <laughs> so it's much. Our emotions give us our response, our reactions, our feelings toward everything. And uh, that's why it's such a great thing. The lover wants next to the good of the beloved. But the lover wants to be loved in return. This completes the circle of love. Now you're getting dizzy now, going around the circle. Where did the circle start? Where did it start? Um, um, I'm getting dizzy too because I'm getting dizzy from the positivity though of love. The great value, the great goodness of love. It's a real game changer of love. It's an unusual apathy toward people and indifference. And the pathetic attitudes that we have toward others. So that's it. That's the philosophical value of love. The nation, the glory of love, the real sign by Pedro Columbus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Every day it's so next to the glory of love by Pedro Columbus. He ain't right if he sings it very, very well. That's the glory of love. That's the glory of love. Amen, amen. Be it so, be it so. Who says that? I'm talking to God with you here. Who used to say that? Amen, amen. Be it so, be it so. And how some guy you went to college with Tom Bucking years ago? Amy, you might know. Who says that? Be it so, be it so. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Be it so, be it so. Who said that? Okay. All right. Lee Hubble. Lee Hubble, remember Lee? Maybe he was too long ago for you guys. I remember him well. He used to say that in his Unitarian prayer, too, that he wrote. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What a love. It was a big song by Leonard Cohen. I don't know. I won't sing it then. Okay, now there's going to be an orgy. Everyone's going to argue here. That's what happened. <clears throat> that he had the Plato dialogue. That's what he said. That's what he wrote. They had a dialogue called the Symposium. And all the people that just saw the guys at the Symposium um, gave their views on love. Most of them were ridiculous. You know, took Plato. But um, at the end of the Symposium, there was an orgy, you know, a sex orgy. You know, they were practicing love. And it was between male and female. They weren't male and female. Um, it didn't matter if they You don't have to reproduce every time you try. You, you have to take them like cat, but to believe in that. I know what it means to take them. Um, we, we don't get things done. There are things we need to do to survive. So I appreciate all coming very much. I'll see you soon. Okay. Good night. I'm German. My name is very German. It was shortened. It used to be Lichten neighbor. But the neighbors didn't like it. So we listened to But good night. And if you want a meaningful night, listen to the midnight special night on FMT. I don't have a station on here. This is WFMT, Midnight Special, great music. And tonight we're going to talk about diamonds in the rough. Well, the whole show, three hours. So it sounds like a great show. Please listen, you'll have a great time. I always do what I had since I first heard about the show in 1966, I think I first heard about it. 
And I've been taping it ever since and playing the tape back in the following week. What's your okay. 98.7 WFMC. I'm sorry I left that out. Every Saturday night, it's a great show. Fantastic. Okay. And um, thank you again. Appreciate it very much for coming. Questions. Okay. Go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. Go ahead. You ready? All right, we're going to do questions now. Who's got the first question for our audience? Uh, remember, go ahead, Bob. Sit down. We'll. Uh, We'll take it from here. I mean, you go back to your seat if you want to just answer. I mean, you just stay there. You can go to your seat, or any any way is fine. I can I can get you from anywhere at all. Who's got questions for Bob? To you, Bob, is how long did it take you to prepare this uh, lecture? And what have you been thinking about it for quite a while? I've been thinking about it most of my life, Jim. Mm -hmm. And um, but how long it took me to write? Not long. A few hours, I'm sorry. Last week, one day, during the day, I'm tired. I don't work. Uh, I have fun instead. I have fun when I work. I taught philosophy for 40 years and I enjoyed it because I learned a lot. I gave a lot of ideas to young people that they'll think about the rest of their mind. They won't answer the questions, of course, but they'll get deeper into them. They'll get more meaning and the more they think about them, which is how I trained, it, trained them to do, like Socrates did. But yeah, I was free during the day to write and it just took me a few hours. Monday and a few hours Tuesday and next week. And because I knew most of the stuff already. So it's been a lifelong development over time then? Well, yeah, looking for love. And philosophy has been almost as long. I went into philosophy because my father was a horrible alcoholic who abused his children emotionally and psychologically and made me feel like garbage. And I felt worthless. I thought philosophy could uh, enlighten me on for basic beliefs like why we exist and what we do, why we do things. And it doesn't really do that, but that's how I oriented it. And yeah, so I've been looking for love for a long time, Jim. Okay, so who I finally up? found it with Mary. What? Well, I was only 24. Who else has got a question for Bob online or here? We got, come on, guys, you got questions on this stuff. Um, Chris, you got a question for us? Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the, uh, the phrase in the Bible um, called uh, um, the love of God surpasses all human understanding? Oh, God, please. Does what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, the phrase in the Bible that says, um, uh, the love of God surpasses all human understanding. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. It certainly does. It surpasses it. That doesn't mean we can't engage in it a lot. And we can't. Uh, um, love God and God can love us, but we can never encompass God. Um, God's love because it's much greater than ours. Our things are much greater than us. We just think we know it all. But, uh, <laughs> but no, God's love does surpass us. But, but we still can know it. We still can be a part of it. Hey, who else has questions? I'm sure, Kelvin, you got something. All right, I'm you, Kelvin. <laughs> Kelvin, if you got a question, I'm, I'm going to say mine. I'm going to say mine third rebuttals, if you don't mind. Okay, go ahead. It's not really a question. Well, go go ahead. We got a little time, so. Okay, what I'd like you to do is um, we we take for for granted at the moment um, when you see like a sporting event like the Super Bowl or the World Cup or a. A world event like Biden, uh, Biden going to the Ukraine or whatever. 
we take it for granted. You know, we've got it for many decades now that worldwide television coverage. I mean, the fact right now that I'm speaking from thousands of miles away to you, right? We've had this for quite some time. We take this for granted now. What I want you to do is cast your mind back to 1968. The very, very first worldwide television broadcast, 1968. And this was a huge technical achievement, but not only was it a technical achievement, it was a huge diplomatic achievement as well. All these different countries, Russia, China, Australia, Brazil, all over the world, people were joining in this, this worldwide television broadcast. And embassies held parties to, to, you know, to, to cement this thing. This, you wouldn't have had the whole world shooting into the moon landings a year later without the very first broadcast that this was. This was, this was an important thing. And I was allowed, I was only 10 years old. I was allowed to stay up to watch the news because it was on the news. And the new BBC came out and says, and now the BBC is going over to Abbey Road Studios where the Beatles will be premiering their new single. And uh, the strains of the Marseillaise went up. Ba -ba 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 now, of course, all these embassy parties, all the French ambassador would stand up. That meant everybody else had to stand up. And the song was, if you can't remember, was All You Need Is Love. Da, ba, 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 ba. All You Need Is Love. Ba, 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 ba. All You Need Is Love. Love. Love is all you need. Thank you. Okay. Um I know Kelvin, we digressed a little bit. Does anybody yeah, 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 yeah. All right, you want you got something, Lana, you want to ask? Mm -mm. Okay, who else has a question back here for Bob? Okay, you got to go ahead. You, you, you could just uh, yeah, go ahead and come up and use the mics. Okay, Peter. All right, Bob, we're gonna let Peter go next. Yeah, on terms, Bob, on terms. We're going to stand yeah. back, back a little bit more. Yeah. Now, now you've got to go back a little more farther. Too. Back to it. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we got you. We got you on camera. Don't worry. I, on your terms, I was wrestling back there about love versus admiration. Can't you express equally, emotively, not quite equally? All right. But um, sustain yourself with the love of your children or your parents is is that enough? It's huge and a lot of respect, and it lasts your whole life. Uh, wives could come and go, and you still have this <coughs> admiration. To your parents and your kids, is that enough? Is that enough for? Well, yes, I think so. Admiration is a very strong word. It's close to love. I think it's a substitute for love. So if you have love, it's hard to have admiration for your children and your wife. It's pretty close to having love. And if you have that, you probably go out there and and work and provide for them. Yeah. If you just admire them highly, we're just pretty close to loving them. No, good question, no. No, but I, but I, I think of my own parents and I think that was a lot of love and I was a kid and just took, took, took. And yet after 21, I thought, well, they did some great things for me. That's pretty close to the highest love I think I have in my heart. Any, anyway, there, there's that in the terms like uh, the agape versus eros or erotica. Um, can one survive without the other in your life? And I think of monasteries and monks and uh, Groups like that, are they on the right track? And is that enough 
towards them. They'll say they're married to Jesus. I've heard that. So is the agape notion enough to live a whole life and a holistic life without heroes? That's a good question. I think um, yeah, yes, it is. Yeah, um, I Agape, though, they only have the erotic, so they don't have the whole world thing. That's a different platform. Thank you, Will. So we don't have both. Yeah, the both is better. One is okay by itself. Agape is good. As long as you find something good to love, you're in good shape. But the more you find the love, yeah, uh, the more you can, um, um, you know, live a fully richer life. It seems like the men and women they teach us about in college, or even on a video, is not about erotic love. I mean, I, I don't know how we champion that. Dancers, I don't, but um, great dancers. But the agape, I'm thinking of Bertrand Russell, I'm thinking about Doc Harmer show seemed to aspire to them. And then, and I also know, well, erotic love is pretty flowing and natural, but the Martin Luther King style or the Gandhian style truly is an accomplishment. So we're, I guess we're back to that agape eros, but yeah, we're in agreement on that. Okay. And then as I was ordering food, I thought, damn, I'm hungry. Where where's the service? And I thought, wait, is that materialism? <coughs> greed or um habit? And why why the hell should I feel guilty about yelling for my food here. I better not do it at home and my wife will hit me with the plate. But, <laughs> you know, and, and is, it, is it motive or is it materialistic? I want my oatmeal. I want my cream of wheat with. with oh, I'd like to ask a question here. What's this guy rambling on? Oh, I want my maple. My maple. Another old one. Yeah, those are wine. About terms, Charlie. It's about terms, Charlie. All right, Charlie, go ahead. You got a question? Okay. Yeah, do we have mouth. something? Go ahead and ask. Here? Is there anybody running this thing? Uh, Charlie, Hi. you know, when it, talk, when it talks about love, you, you, do, uh, you do have a tendency to, uh, <laughs> to, to uh, make the uh, philosophy of love a little bit uh, taxing sometimes. <laughs> You know, for even liking a guy like you, sometimes it can be taxing, but you know, we, we like you anyway. Uh, speak so, for yourself, Joe. All right, well, here we go. Uh, <laughs> Bob's going to come back into the thing and go ahead and ask your question, Charlie. We're moderating. Yes, during the 1960s, there were protesters against the Vietnam War, uh, and they were accused of not loving their country. They said, love it or leave it. Now, when you give it, students, young students are expected daily to make a pledge of allegiance and place their hand on their heart. Where does that stem from? What is, what a government is an organization. What exactly is that all about? Where does that come from? Love it or leave it or love or love your country, Charlie. All right, Bob, Bob, you I think you got that you got the floor now to answer Charlie's question. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. What's the question? Where does it come from? Where does why, love... why does love a polis, the polis political entity? Why am I expected to love a, a an organization which a government is? I why I can I looked upon it objectively, but then again they have ceremonies, rituals, uh, such as on the Fourth of July, 
uh, solemn events. <laughs> and they have other things like rules, the American flag, and so forth. But if you criticize, critique the government, you're accused of disloyalty and not loving your country. Why should I love the country? I don't think you have to. I don't think love of country is demanded. I don't think you have to love it early. The country is a very hard thing to love. It's so big and personal. Care so little about an individual. There's no obligation to love one's country. As I just said, it's too big. It's a suitable object of love. And people demand that it just seem nonsensical. And they just seem over patriotic. Probably most of them are very much. Part of society, which society loves to do. You know, so we'll be more compliant. And they do a good job at it. They're very effective in brainwashing. That's not love. Nobody loves the country. I just, by the way, I was among the first protests to Vietnam War and some justice. And they were going to draft me <laughs> and go kill innocent people over there, murder them. But um, I told them if they drafted me, I'd make trouble for them, but then writing to them. I never heard from them again. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> and I would have too. No doubt I did. Okay. Uh, who else has a question, please? Uh, I, I've got a question. Go Thank ahead. You. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people, uh, like Charles was talking about, who were uh, young and advocating for uh, peace and love during the uh, uh, during the uh, the time where you know the in the sixties and so forth, and so forth. And a lot of them have grown up to uh, to be in 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 Congress. And there, it doesn't seem to be any love there at all. What do you think happened to uh, to love uh, in our leadership in our country? Yeah, yeah. You, you can try to speculate as best you can. <clears throat> He's asking about why there's no love in Congress anymore, and. Uh, do you think that there might be, a, Chris, I don't know if I'm, I'm paraphrasing it correctly. Well, yeah, because a lot of them grew up in, in, during the uh, during the peace movement um, and they advocated for peace and free will. And they don't seem to have, uh, what happened? What do you think happened uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to love in terms of, uh, of, of their leadership? You would think that 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 love would be perpetual and and you know uh, flourishing, but it doesn't seem to be that way at all. Do you happen to think uh, about what might have happened to that? I think the love still there, and these kind of things were up in the I think they still love the country. They still remain. He could make a lot more money elsewhere, probably, the rest of their lives. They're, they're still in love by trying to collect the loans of the country and make it as good as they can. I think they're still love there. It's a different form, of course. All the time, the case is different, like I said, the way they're doing. Love is unique. Very unique emotion. All is different. Um, I've got a question for you, Bob, if you don't mind. Uh, when I look in uh, scripture and I see uh, uh, things, for, for example, um, in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, 
It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, and it keeps no records of wrongs. That to me sounds like love is more of a choice in the way you treat others than just a feeling or a philosophy. Can you comment, please? Okay. There's microphone. Raise his microphone. He's the guy who's uh, going to uh, Damascus to persecute Christians right now. Oh, and so on. Okay. And uh, something too long in the desert, he fell off his horse and he hit his head and thought God was speaking to him to uh, love Christians and become a Christian himself. He became the greatest Christian evangelist there ever was. He was quite an eloquent guy. And this thing that Tim was referring to. In First Corinthians, with his letter to Corinthians, who, by the way, were the same ones who did not believe um, in heaven. And Paul wrote him back and said, No, heaven's not a place where your soul goes. Heaven's a place where your body goes after it dies to be resurrected, just like Jesus was. You know, so he corrected them on that. But he was talking about love to the Corinthians at Corinth, that great Greek city. Um, and, um, I want to uh, talk about this which I forgot to do in my talk, and I wouldn't have time anyway. But Paul wrote a letter to his Corinthians to the King Kate from town to town, and out of town. Pretty funny guy, but uh, he told the Corinthians to strive eagerly for the greatest spirits of your spirit. I shall show you still more excellent. Speaking terms, I mean, and jealous if they believe in your faith, and jealous from if you don't have love, I'm a resounding gong and a clashing cymbal. So if you don't have love, whatever you say is just a bunch of noise, a loud noise, maybe, resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. And if I had to give the prophecy from God and comprehend all the mysteries and all knowledge, if I have faith uh, to move mountains, even though my faith moves mountains, but do not have love, I have nothing. Nothing if you don't have love. Even if you have to get the prophecy, but you don't love, don't move any mountains. But to do it, my, if I give everything I own and have my, hand my body over so that I may boast and do not have love, I have nothing. I'm not sure what it means there. Um, I'll leave you to ponder that. But Paul goes on and he says, Love is patient, love is kind. It's true. And true. It's not jealous. Now he's the people are a bunch of negative. It's not jealous, it's not pompous, it's not enslaved, it's not rude. You know, it's the opposite of it. It's trying not speak its own interest, it's not quick tempered. Things are bad things, love is a good thing. It's not rude or angry. It's not rejoice over long doing. So rejoice. Ah, please talk in the microphone. It does not rejoice over long doing. Paul rejoices with the truth. It bears all wrongs. Believes all things. I'm not sure what that means. Believes all things. Uh, I think it means it believes in everything. Good or positive, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. Very true. All of it. Um, and St. Paul, well, he was a saint, the Catholic, he missed the handout, but where I got him. Everyone has it. I have more to it. It's great. He's praying very eloquent, very eloquent. So thanks for reminding me of it. Okay, but that doesn't really answer the point of my question. The point of the matter is, does love require an act of action from you to choose that course, or is it more or less just a philosophy? I choose to love my neighbor. I choose to love my girlfriend. I choose to make peace with my neighbor, for example. Oh, yes, but love, love requires action. 
requires a choice, requires you to choose it, implement it, do it, to be loving, and not just philosophize about it, to actually do it. Does that answer your question, Tim? Yes. Now, how? what do you recommend is the best way to choose that course of action? Do good. Do as much good as you can. Make the most meaning that you can. Have the most positive effects on people and the world and everything you come in contact with. Just have good positive effects or make meaning. I think that's the best way. Does that mean somebody has to be a member of, like, as I found myself, one. the most effective way that I'm able to choose love is through the Christian faith that I exhibit. And, you know, it's, it, it all comes down to accountability and actions and um, how you get, treat people and how you do things. Uh, what would you recommend a good way to choose that way is, as a philosophy, so to speak? Well, as a religion, it's good Christianity. It's good because it preaches love, it preaches love better than um, any other religion does. Okay. It preaches, I didn't say it practices it. It certainly <laughs> preaches it better. It makes it more essential. So being a Christian found its um, commands. Um, where, where are the uh, first three commandments? Do you remember it's all up there? Um, I think the first one is thou shalt not place false gods before me and I'm a little shy on the other two. I don't think they're about love. But those are just commandments and you know, religions based on love. So it's a good religion to follow. If, uh, if you're looking for love, philosophically, you could just think about it. Just think about love, know about it, write about it. <clears throat> but mostly think. Mm. And do references, resources like uh, Wikipedia on love is good. And what else? Uh, there's a great idea book. I guess you, most people in that have seen that the kind of love is very good. Just read about love. There's lots of books on it, and they're all helpful a little bit. I don't have the whole answer, of course, nobody does, but we get more and more the more we look. Oh, we could go backwards some of the time, but we'll, we'll go forward usually. You know, it, it does say- uh, just, yes. just, Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just go ahead. on the point, anybody who thinks that um, love it always requires a choice has never been struck by lightning. You've never had that instant what the fuck happened there? And I knew you were just, if they have never fallen in love in that moment. That's, they, sometimes it's not something you choose. It's sometimes it's something that, that happens to you. You must be talking about the, uh, what they call romantic love or something like that. Yes. Yeah, I know that uh, that is brought part of because I can tell you right now, even in scripture, um, there is a little bit. Have you ever heard of the book called The Song of Solomon? No. Oh, for example, it is, it is, it is actually the Song of Solomon is the heart of the Old Testament. Yeah, it says, uh, especially when he's meeting a girl, you have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel on your necklace. It does. It's talk that. Me. It's that great love. It's a. Uh, it's a love. It's a love affair at the start of uh, Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. Your face was. Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her stand uh, bathing on the roof, the moonlight, and the beauty all through you. Yeah. I said I love my neighbor. He's a jerk. Well, <laughs> you got to get along with him, Charlie. That's why. <laughs> you know. The maniac. Well, at least yeah, loving him will help him keep the guns put away, Charlie. Yeah, he is a gun toting maniac, danger to the community. Well, well remember <laughs> that's that phrase back again. 
the love of God passes all human understanding. Maybe yeah. that's a little tough on us too. <laughs> we don't oh, yeah. Especially loving some of the people here at the college. I mean, you know, lest we talk about love between Republicans and Democrats. <laughs> yeah, yes. they're after each other all the time. Well, well, sir, I've got is... a question here. Go ahead. Why is love apparently of great importance? I see these Hallmark movies where young women have some sort of obligation to pair bond and have a romantic love. Whereas you don't find similar more men are more inclined to watch action movies and kung fu and they regard it as in fact they regard it as some sappy kind of stuff. What is why is there this dichotomy regarding this? It doesn't seem to be philosophy aims towards a universal. And love apparently is far from a universal. Well, go ahead, uh, Bob. You want to comment on that? What's the question, Charlie? Where did he go? Where did he go for a walk? <laughs> All right. Why is romantic love important to women and not to men? I guess that's mostly cultural because in our society, women are made to be inferior. So they have to depend on men. They ask them to marry them and to provide for them so that they have families and children. So that's mostly social conditioning. And women end up in an inferior position. And so they're more interested in romantic love than men are. Men like their freedom. Their parents do what they want when they want. Women are having a hard time doing that. Usually. Who else has questions? All right. Well, we'll get we'll get to uh, 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 Mike. Well, come on up if you want. Oh, I, I, um, I know that early Steinhardt election in Phaedrus, um, Plato describes that um, agape as well can form a type of madness. Um, and he, he, just, he describes how uh, this can distract people from their philosophical and uh, self actualization goals. So I wanted to ask if. Agape, if even agape is considered to be a distraction, what should we consider maybe a higher calling or a higher goal than love? Excellent question. Um, in very insightful. Plato does say that when people are in love, they're in madness when they're distracted from philosophizing. And we cannot see in the spite of the wealth. So often play with pulling our flag because of us. He's being ironic and paradoxical. Oh, by the way, I forgot that at the end. That love is. Um, Easy and hard, complex but simple. It's a paradox. It's a paradox. You know what a paradox is? Yes. Yep. Here's two doctors, paradox. A couple of doctors, paradox. Now, a paradox is something that seems contradictory, but it's really true. Love is simple but complex. Love is easy but it's hard. Um, back to Plato and Phaedrus. Um, I think Plato was pulling in our way. Um, somewhat being ironic by saying that, um, we gotta work, get away from the madness of love and get back to philosophy. 
as a question if not we'll go to rebuttals yeah i've got a question all right charlie go ahead why is it in the christian western culture there's a god of love and yet if you go to other cultures the gods don't necessarily love mankind as a matter of fact they're rather this measure of hostility and they're dangerous uh what is this all about here um the christian goes on and on and on well love love you know and you go to other cultures and that's not the case at all i can't recollect in buddhism uh any sort of love the matter of fact they've got little bothersome creatures who make your life uncomfortable. <laughs> but is that strictly a cultural thing? I think Christianity is the religion that most preachers love. I don't think that's cultural. That's Western. All Western cultures now. And since Christianity was developed in the West, well, as I said earlier, it was founded in the East, like all the religions were. <clears throat> the West is not very religious whatsoever. Uh, the West is scientific, materialistic, and all it has been. Ever since Aristotle took down, uh, we've been nothing but a bunch of materialists. And look toward physical reality, whereas in the East, they're more spiritual. Okay. Any, 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 any else? Okay, let's go now to rebuttals. Um, Dave, you want to go first? I think that would go five minutes with the, with the lack of response right now. So just uh, get up there, grab the mic, and go at it. We'll. Uh, Parse off the time accordingly. Bob, if you want to relax for a while and get, go get the last word. Go ahead and either sit down, leave, or you can stay right where you're at or whatever. But uh, go ahead and uh, read your way. I do dispute what Charlie said about romantic love. Men do need and desire romantic love as much as anyone else. It's just that we do not, that's we're the less obvious about it than women. And we don't necessarily choose <clears throat> to read romantic novels or watch romantic movies. But on the other hand, if you've read a, a Louis Lemoore Western novel, you will note that the story of the guy usually winds up getting a girl. And why should that surprise anyone? And that's what I wanted to say. That's it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll second that. If you if you look at those movies a second time, you'll bet you may. Right, I'll take a classic story, um, Homer's Iliad. Odysseus was trying to get, go through all this to get back to his wife. If you look at Die Hard, you got Bruce Willis is doing all that because he still loves his ex-wife. You know? Okay, maybe they're not, it's not the whole Mark movie, right? And maybe it involves a few car chases and stuff, but mostly, the, you know, when you know, as the song says, you know, you can bet he was doing it for some dame. I got one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got one. Go, go ahead. He's not paying attention. <laughs> um. Well, uh, this this uh, concept about love, 
apparently <laughs> seems to be uh, in the hands of women instead of men. Uh, quoting the book, women are from Venus and men are from Mars. Can't hear. Yeah, what is going on here? Every 10 minutes or so tonight, someone's raised the question of, well, how are women treated under that particular dictate or mandate? Or that's come up a lot. That makes us thinking, even Bob said there, there aren't any uh, women leaders and Catholicism, and I, I think there is that Mother Teresa situation, and there's a cult of Mary. I noticed in Latin America, and they will parade in the streets over it and stay up late in novena prayer. And even in Pilsen, I saw Polish women kneeling, and it was mainly women, kneeling on the stone steps of St. Adelbert to try to save it. The city doesn't care about their prayer. Uh, but, but, um, then I'm thinking of polar opposites more, more than the cult of Mary. I'm thinking of the Muslim faith. And it, it seems to exclude women who need to sit far from the men in the, in the church. And I don't know what the fear is and the loathing of that situation where it derives. But I can't think of a, a Muslim leader um, in their holy book, in the Quran. That, that was female, but maybe you all, somebody knows the Quran more and can talk about one. I'm at a loss there. There is a Mother Teresa type of young woman now who gets a lot of press because she was shot during the Iran or Iraq controversy and uh, some mercenaries did shoot her and she survived brain injury. She's getting a lot of attention, but it's mostly secular. It's, it's, not, about, it's not mentioning Allah and what she did uh, in her. Oh, like, it wasn't political either. It was just for the world's peace. And in doing that, she got shot. Um, but she's back on the talk show circuit. And I had a Muslim friend of mine say, oh, she was part of the CIA. She was manipulated. And I thought, buddy, <coughs> break. He said, no, she talks too much. And I thought, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Um, it's deep in the culture. And uh, enlighten me on that, you know, if anybody knows. If there's some praise in the, in the Islamic world for women. Okay, uh, is that it, Peter? That, that's all. I mean, it's come up a lot tonight, and uh, it's a, a hot point, hot button issue in these times we live in. Many women would rather stay home than go to worship um, in a patriarchy, I'll put it that way. Okay, that's your rebuttal. Uh, Justin, you don't want to say anything real quick? Mr. Tucker, our, our libertarian chair, your views on love. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Justin. Uh, okay, can you see me? No. I can't see you yet, but uh, we Okay, might. well, hey, uh, sorry, I got in here late, but this is the, uh, the topic is uh, of the philosophy of love. So I just wanted to share a poem uh, this is uh, this is from a man 
named Fat Mike. And Fat Mike is the bass player and lead singer of a band called No Effects. Blast. Oxygen mask. Smoke-filled cabin. Depressurized. Don't be afraid. Hold on to me. We're going down, but not our love. Death don't seem so bad when I'm with you, my only love. So close your eyes. Kiss me one last time. We're going to die. It's a wonderful poem. There's definitely an ending. Has he written others? <laughs> he disappeared. All right. Are you done, Justin? Who's next? Anyone? It sounds like a remake of Romeo and Juliet going down. Maybe it isn't caught up, but all I ever learned from love was how to shoot somebody exactly. down. Yeah. Okay, uh, Justin's back. All right, who else? Who else has a? Who else has a rebuttal here? Yeah, I do. Go right ahead. All right, first of all, I'd like to thank Bob. For putting together his lecture here. It's been, I know he put some time and effort into it and for the, uh, the handout. Uh, so thank you very much, Bob. I'll be eclectic as usual here by a cover number of things. There's a definite cultural divide regarding uh, love. I marketed paperback books for a number of years and we had two different types. We had uh, the romantic type. I remember the one title in particular called Sweet Savage Love, which was a bestseller. <laughs> I had the job of selecting paperback books that you saw on revolving racks at train stations and stores and uh, airports and things like that. I selected the titles. But on the other side, I had all these cowboy books uh, Louis L'Amour, uh, shoot em up westerns, and uh, I remember one called The Wolfer, uh, but there seems to be a different uh, orientation between the male and female uh, regarding the, the taste of culture. I believe there are, the term is used in two totally different ways. You might even add a third if you wish. Um, there, of course, is the romantic love uh, that we find in literature and movies. Uh, and um, it seems to be of importance among young women to have a romantic relationship, an obligation of some sort, whereas I don't think such an obligation is imposed upon uh guys in the same fashion uh, the, the other type of love that is spoken of i don't know i think is perhaps a generic use as i indicated there's love of country oh and i was thinking of the expression i love that chicken from popeye i said what, what do you mean you love chicken you know particular uh fast food so those are two totally different obviously different expressions or sentiments. Uh, so it's used in different ways. A number of years ago, I did a quite a bit of research, more than I probably should have, but I gave a lecture on Darwin and evolution. And certainly I think this love condition uh, has evolved for the purpose of pair bonding. Uh, and has a biological basis. 
um, it is other species seems to go through a struce periods. Uh, that's certainly not love. However, it is often mistaken for it, or or uh, but it does serve the utilitarian purpose and perpetuation of the species. The condition of love might even, I think, be a condition in which certain chemicals are released in the uh, autotomic nervous system uh, that are pleasant uh, conditions. The other thing that I find peculiar about the expression of love is that uh, people who marry on the basis of love and individuals who break apart adopt the opposite <clears throat> sentiment. They are often adversarial. Now, maybe that's the same thing, expression of love, but it's rather peculiar, such as in divorce situation, they will try to inflict harm on the other, even in terrible instances, which I don't want to get into. But um, it is a thing. Another thing regarding love, the Christians go, love, love is God is love. And I couldn't help stop thinking, we had a lecture in the other college on the institution of slavery. Now across the Bible Belt, uh, you certainly have a tremendous attention to this religion and is the basis of which is love. And at the same time, these are the people who owned and fought for the institution of slavery. Now they thought perhaps they, were they also were the ones who advocated for the abolition of slavery. Well, I believe those were more in the North. But Doesn't matter, still Christians and Christians all over oppose slavery. There were 13 but, yeah, but not on the basis, not on the basis of uh, Leviticus, Leviticus. Yeah, very, very yeah they based it on the Leviticus what, of loving your neighbor you as know, yourself. You can own slaves from a different country. Irregardless, yeah. there were 13 states that elected to try to separate themselves yeah. and sustain the institution of slavery, where you find the greatest expression of Christian sentiments. Uh, and I have looked into this topic. I've read their sermons. Uh, and uh, I find that a most peculiar dichotomy. But one does not expect perfection. That's probably why one reason one goes towards religion is to recognize their failures. If, if you're, but if you're looking for um, ways to be an abolitionist, you won't find it in the Bible. <laughs> the New Testament. Yeah. Well, certainly you can. Mm -hmm. Jesus there, Christ no. uh, never mentioned anything about there, slavery. There, there is about no loving yeah, your neighbor, yeah, 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 liberation. Okay, it's my yeah. turn, pal. Uh, the, the New there Testament. No discussion. The New Testament condones slavery just as much as the Old Testament does. Slaves well, I'm talking specifically master. about Jesus. Slaves obey and love your master. Is was 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 Jesus's. Okay, uh, guys, uh, let let let's let Charlie finish. All right. I, I'll finish up and you guys can go to it. Uh, regarding that, the thing regarding slavery is that, and I sponsored an academic uh, event on this, human rights. Uh, there is no discussion or recognition of human rights in the scriptures. So that's why largely you find it Slavery could in fact be authorized because it's not prohibited. Now, the last thing I wanted to say, he mentioned the Islamic religion and the treatment of women. And what happened was Muhammad had six wives or so, and he came home and there would be domestic disputes. And actually, if you go into the Quran, you find that about 75% of the advice given there is regarding domestic relationships. And I don't want to make light of the Islamic faith, 
But they apparently had arguments like who Mohammed would go home and say, whose turn was it to wash dishes or something? But that's why you find a lot of domestic, the rules in the Islamic faith pertain to domestic relationships. Anyhow, thank you, Bob. You gave us something to talk about. I'm gonna let you guys argue about abolitionists and slavery. Okay, go to it. Thank you very much. Norma, do you want to say hey, something? Charlie, why do you, uh, if you're against slavery, why are you a communist? <laughs> Well, I, I would also add that in, in, in the uh, New Testament, there's a lot about uh, there, there's servants that are actually serving. There's a ton of that in the, in, in a lot yeah, of the you, discussions. You there, you just FYI. What do you say? What do you say? You won't find what you can say. You find active encouragements of slavery in the Bible. The whole, yeah. There's a whole section in Leviticus dedicated to uh, um, encouraging you to have slaves from a different country rather than, rather than slaves from your own country. Right. All right, we got one from Andy Anderson coming up next, so go ahead. Uh, uh, <laughs> Norma is also raising her hand, just FYI. All right, Norma, we'll get you after Andy, okay? Go oh. ahead, Andy, then we'll get you, Norma. Uh, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, so. Uh, I'd like to thank Bob for all the words about the meaning of love and everything. But I, I'd like to mention a website that has portraits. There's a website uh, that describes Americans who love America by their actions. It's called Americans Who Tell the Truth. Robert Chetterly has so far painted 65 portraits of uh, famous Americans who've dedicated their lives. They love the country. They love their fellow man. Many of them risked their lives, went to prison, all kinds of things. Uh, from Lois Gibbs, Love Canal, Ralph Nader spent his whole life trying to protect Americans. Uh, many university professors have spoke out about uh, subjects that are taboo in the main, mainstream media, such as uh, forensic evidence of 9-11, uh, the forensic evidence of who murdered JFK. Um, Many of these people have nothing and everything to lose by speaking out and telling the truth. But since they love they love this country, they risk their lives, their livelihoods, their jobs across the board. So that's, that's yes. Americans to tell the truth. Word. One of the most inspirational websites that I know of for finding out uh, learning what decent people can do when they put their mind to it and tell the truth regardless of the consequences. There's just inspirational stories all over that site. So Americans who tell the truth. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Norma, you're next. Okay, well, what comes to mind to me from some of the things that have been said recently is that uh, it's human nature to be for just us. And it's an aspiration that we have to uh, have justice, which is for helping people throughout the world, including people of other races and, and uh, colors and doing away with slavery. And, and I'm proud to be of the love generation that was marching for, for love and peace against the war in Vietnam and, and uh, wish that you know we could have more peaceful discussions and loving discussions about things we have differences about it's gotten to be more and more um hostile and more uh anger acted out about what i want what i want when i want it get out of my way kind of thing so uh, it seems like at, when I'm out in the world, it looks like we're moving out from the principle of being loving in response to others, even though sometimes we're at odds with each other. Okay, anything else, Norma? Nope, oh, that's it. All right, I'm going to give a brief one. My, uh, actually, I'll forego it. 
Who else has a rebuttal? You do. You want a little more, Dave? Yes, very briefly. Okay. Um, at the time of at the time of the Civil War, yes, there were Christians who spoke up in favor of slavery all over the South. There are also a great many Christians up in the North and other groups that denounced slavery, particularly the Quakers. So the idea that somehow all Christians were in favor of slavery is nonsense. The biggest example of that was John Brown. <laughs> and finally, Charlie, I, I echo Justin's question. If you're opposed to slavery, why are you a communist? I think it's a worthwhile question. <laughs> All right, and I'll... also, solid reference with the John Brown there, uh, Mr. Zucker. All right. I'm going to give a real brief rebuttal myself. The guy was nuts. The guy was a complete nutcase. I, I think the abolitionists... Oh, the, Christians, the Christian abolitionists were abolitionists despite what it says in the Bible, not because of what it says in the Bible. Right. Yes, I feel they did that because they took Christ's words uh, as literally as they could. I feel that... No, that, Christ said, slaves love your master. He said there was nothing in the Bible against slavery. Absolutely. Okay, wait, wait a minute. Hey, Tim. Yeah. Regarding John Brown, I spent a lot of time, many many days in Harper's Ferry, where he operated. Now, here's a guy that's a Christian, and he his goal was to get weapons, long pikes, like they used in the Middle Ages, to kill slave owners. Why? How What's do, wrong with that? How do you reconcile <laughs> this? Christian love, Christian love, get a pike, <laughs> get a big pike and go out there and mayhem, great mayhem. Hey, Charlie, would you rather have him you know, would you rather they he just sent them to the gulag or something? Okay. Or the firing squad? All right, anyway, um, let's get it back because I'm gonna give a real brief rebuttal myself. I'm just finishing up a book by C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity. And it talks about love, not only about the love of your fellow man, your neighbor as yourself, but the love of God and what he had for us. No man have any love greater than this than to lay down his one life for a friend. We all know that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, for our evil nature, and that we could come in and learn from him and renew our relationship with him. God loved us, but he doesn't want robots. And that's why there's sin in the world. We freely choose him or not. And to me, that's one of the greatest gifts of love around is you take a risk, and let it go sometimes and still care about them. One of the reasons I'm a Christian is I freely chose the faith. I uh, acknowledge my sin before God that I did wrong from him, which is why we all have that moral code inside of us that note that distinguishes right from wrong. That's part of what C.S. Lewis calls the uh, nature of man. But anyway, I'd like to thank Bob again tonight for doing some good things and we'll give him the last word and then we'll adjourn. So Bob, you're up next. Okay. Okay. Well, we got, we got uh, maybe yeah. 20 minutes, but don't use them all. We'll try to, we got, we, you can get, you get the last word. Remind him of his mic. Yeah, don't forget about your microphone. Close to the mic if you don't mind, please. Yeah, all right. Well, where are the others? Interested in love. There were eight, now four of them are leaving already. Well, actually, it's two and a half damn hours. It's way too long. Um, thanks for coming, guys. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Staying so long, too. It's ungodly. No one, no one needs to respond, like I said. Um, well, I know there's interested, there's a lot of people on, on Zoom, only four to take the to come and be friends, even. Well, oh, so, everybody can get love out of that. Well, some of know, them are from Dallas, that's why, and some are from England. Okay, but they're still interested, they're still listening, that's great. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but where are they here? They're not interested, they're not interested in love. Why are they interested? Politics? 
Good luck. What the hell are you going to do there with the Cuban Democrats and the Republican Party? You know, damn thing. You're supposed to love them wherever they're at. I run for this time. Love them wherever they are. No, 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 no. All right, Charlie. <laughs> Vietnam. I think I said what I had to say about Vietnam. Probably doesn't need it. Um, Um, oh, Charlie raised a good point. Charlie, of all people, no, I'm kidding. Charlie raised a good point about how can you love his neighbors or Ben? No, I have points of those too. That's a real problem. I didn't address it. I'll have to do some, something about them in the future. How can you love someone like that? They don't care about anyone else. Just want to suffer themselves, and they're all over the place. And that's a typical person. That's a real tipper right there. He just wants to suffer himself and cares only about himself. That's average. That's normal. And we got to deal with them every day. How the hell do we love them? That's awful hard. I didn't address that. And I got a lot of thinking to do about them. Maybe some reading if I can find anything about them. So I emphasize again the importance of logic. And there are rules for thinking, there are rules for good thinking and bad thinking, even opinions, even value judgments can be evaluated. If you know the laws of logic, but most people don't know squat about that, but there are such laws. And they do govern our thinking, they do govern our rules. All types of ways to determine what's good and what's bad. So it's not all relative. You know, there are absolutes. In my book, um, I mentioned several of them, four of them. For example, uh, by the way, my book will be featured in the Sunday New York Times. I'll be reviewed there on March 5th. You can get the New York Times at the um, newsstand, like the city newsstand at six corners. So if they have the New York Times at the end. Or contact me at my email, which is on this handout I gave you tonight. Contact mm -hmm. me and I'll make sure you get a review. That's going to really get the word out. The New York Times has 9 million subscribers worldwide, online and in print. I'm really going to get my message about making the email. Plus, my book will be featured on uh, Amazon Top 10 list in four to eight weeks. As well. <laughs> read one of my books and she really loves it. You can put it on Amazon Top 10 list. So that'll get a lot of sales. That'll get the message out. The things are going very well for me in that regard. Um, okay, three hours and um, why aren't any women here? You know, me love, you know, all about love. The screen has 40% of women. Oh, really? That's good. Yeah, that's good for the people. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But yeah, so why couldn't women bother to come? Too much trouble for them. Well, it's not important. They got better things to do. Sit home and grab books <laughs> and watch it on Zoom. <clears throat> Sorry, I couldn't just read this. Now. Well, uh, <laughs> I wish we had you on more visual. Am I ready? Maybe we can drop the ball on that. Oh, good. Oh, you're too good about it. This little stuff. By different cultures and uh, just many videos. Uh, you can seek them out on YouTube or Facebook or any social media. We have a lot of that. Well, mostly YouTube and Facebook. But mostly YouTube. But stuff on love videos, on love lives, and just want to look at that yourself. Um, but it could be a very visual thing. I was hoping it would be tonight, but. It shouldn't have to be about that. But all I got to say is just thank you again for coming and uh, taking us so much time. I'll forward it. I'll forward it. Uh, I'll forward it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish tonight will absorb the college. Just a one little clip here that might be useful. Oh, yeah. For me and the Lord.
Like I said, me and the Lord, we have an understanding. We're on a mission from God. Thank you for attending tonight. Thank you very yeah. much. Let's close the meeting, all right? You're not supposed to add to the meeting. You're the chair. The chair elected to have a little bit of ending video. All right. We'll, we'll see you guys later, things. Charlie. I'm going to flip the host control. I'm going to, I'm going to turn the host control to you so you can uh, keep the chat going while we get in there. So you're now the host, and we'll see you guys later. Uh, you can keep the discussion going with Charlie for a little while, and uh, have a good night, everybody. Thanks for the journey of love around the world. Thank you. All right.